We're going to begin with a test. Blankety. Deal or? Who wants to be a? Millionaire. The weakest? Link. Count? Down. Robot? Wars. Scrap heap? Challenge. Give yourselves a round of applause, Ascension. You passed the test. You passed the TV game show aficionado test. Well done. Now, it's that last TV game show, Scrap Heap Challenge, that I want to think a little bit with you about today. Scrap Heap Challenge. Has anyone seen it? Put a hand up, please. Some of us. Has anyone not seen it or heard of it? Okay. Well, I recommend you check it out. For those of you um, who don't know, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It was one of my favorite TV shows as a child. And here's the premise. In every episode of Scrap Heap Challenge, there are teams of contestants who compete to construct a machine. But they have to use only what they can scavenge from a big scrapyard. And then at the end of each episode, their junk machines have a big showdown to see which one works the best. So one episode, for example, uh, they had to make cannons. Uh, another time they had to make cars, a car which could also be a boat. Uh, one time they had to make flying machines. But whatever it was, every single episode, it was the same. They always had to make their machine completely and solely out of scrap. Now we're at church today. We are not watching game shows. So what has Scrap Heap Challenge got to do with anything? Well, it strikes me that Scrap Heap Challenge is a godly game show. There is something about it that brushes close to the heart of God, the God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. And hopefully you'll see what I mean once we've delved into today's passage together a little bit more. We're continuing today in our series on the book of Acts, and we are with Paul, the first person to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the Mediterranean world. And we've um, gone over a few chapters, or we've skipped a few chapters, and at this point, we're with Paul on his travels, and he's just been bundled off by some rather worried Christians in Macedonia who were scared that he'd get in trouble where he was. So they bundle him off on a boat down to the small city of Athens, which was in those days a very small city. Uh, historically, Athens had been a, a big, grand center of learning and philosophy, um, and it had, by Paul's time, endured a number of years of Roman rule under which that had kind of dwindled. But nonetheless, when Paul was there, you could still find philosophers wandering around the streets, sharing their ideas. And when he gets to Athens, Paul decides to spend his time day by day in the marketplace, which was the city center, not just of commerce, but the city center of conversation. It's where people went to talk and share ideas. And it's here in the marketplace that Paul gets called a mean word. It's verse 18. Um, if you've got your Bibles, I'd encourage you to keep them open. Let's take a look at verse 18. It says, A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. And some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? What is this babbler trying to say? This word, translated babbler in our Bibles, in fact means much more than that. It's much more derogatory. If someone came up to me and called me a babbler, I wouldn't really be that offended. It's not that mean, is it? But what these people are actually saying is worse than babbler. I think we could better translate it scrap collector. Scrap collector. Scrounger. The Greek word is spermologos, and in its most basic sense, that the word means someone who picks up seeds, spermologos, someone who picks up speeds, seeds. Um, now, originally, it refers to birds who would 
uh, peck grain from the ground from the fields. But more metaphorically, this word was used to name the scrap collectors who would scour marketplaces for junk and offcuts. And this is what they're calling Paul. Here you are, Paul, lounging about our marketplace, snapping up bits of ideas from other people and spreading them around without really understanding what you're talking about. Paul, they're saying, is a good-for-nothing scrap collector. He's talking junk. But despite their derision of Paul, it seems that they actually found him quite entertaining at the same time. And they ask him, uh, not a little sarcastically and kind of wryly, to expand on what he's saying. Um, If you look at verse 20, let's have a look at the question that they ask him. They say, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? This is a question that mocks Paul. First, by asking whether they're permitted to know more. May we know more? Which, of course, is a sarcastic question. And then they throw in an insult, newness, this new teaching. When in the ancient world, uh, completely opposite from our world today, in the ancient world, new ideas meant bad ideas, and old ideas were good ones. And then finally, they point out that it is you, Paul, alone, who are presenting this teaching, and thereby they're kind of isolating him from any other sources of authority or figures of authority. May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. Poor Paul is not off to a very good start. He's already the scrap collector. He's already the butt of these people's jokes and their contempt. But when Paul answers them, he does something that's actually quite funny. He picks up the insult of scrap collector and he wears it with pride. People of Athens, he begins, I see that in every way you are very religious. And then, if you read closely, he goes on to play scrap heap challenge. Taking scraps of the Athenian religion and culture that he's picked up on, recycling them, and then presenting them back to the Athenians in a way that points to Jesus. Look at the scraps I've found, he says. Here's one, an altar that says it's to an unknown God. Look, you don't even know what you're worshipping. I can tell you about the God who has chosen to make himself known. Here's another little scrap. One of your ancient philosophers said about God, in him we live and move and have our being. That's right, but that doesn't mean God is far away and beyond our concern, like you Epicureans believe. It means God is right here. He is not far away from any one of us. Or what about this other scrap that I picked up from one of your poets? We are his offspring. Yes, we are. But that doesn't mean, like you Stoics believe, that we and the world around us are God and that we can therefore go around creating divinities out of gold and silver. No, it means that God is not the same as us. We're his offspring. We're related to him, but we're not him. So it's useless trying to commandeer this God with idols. That's an elaborated version of what Paul was saying. But do you see what he's doing? He's scrap collecting. He's a scrap collector and he's a very creative one. He's recycling the culture and the artifacts and the ideas around him for a new purpose. He's taking them and using them to point people to the true God. Paul is being a scrap collector. But not only this, more importantly, Paul is also showing his Athenian audience that God is a scrap collector. And God behaves completely unlike any other gods that they had heard about before. Uh, In the first century Mediterranean world that Paul was traveling through, no one would have known what you'd meant if you'd said to them, what church do you go to? Or what religion are you? They wouldn't have known what you meant because people didn't have religions. They had gods. 
This was the case in Athens, maybe more than anywhere else. People had gods, many gods dotted around the towns, all with different purposes. And priests were the people whose job it was to keep the sanctuary or the shrine going, doing the sacrifices, etc. And we get a taste of, of how crowded with gods this world was. A few chapters back in Acts chapter 14, when Paul is in Lystra in modern-day Turkey, and he and his friend Barnabas are themselves mistaken for gods after they heal a man who couldn't walk. And the local priest uh, rushes to the scene to quickly make the right sacrifices. I'll just read this bit out from Acts 14. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. We see this culture of many gods also here in our passage from today. Look at verse 18. Let's read verse 18 again. It says, Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Now we've got to be careful here because to our ears, when we hear Jesus and the resurrection, we think Jesus of Nazareth and his resurrection from the dead. Obvious. But, as many scholars have pointed out, what Paul's Athenian audience were hearing when Paul talked about Jesus and the resurrection was a God called Jesus and a goddess called resurrection or anastasis. That's why they said he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They thought that Paul was introducing two new gods to them, Jesus and resurrection. Paul must have been so frustrated. He must have been at a loss. He must have been tearing his hair out. They just didn't get it. No, he says, I'm not talking about two gods. I'm talking about the God, the one and only God who has revealed to himself, himself to us by actually resurrecting an actual human being called Jesus. Finally, it seems that the people Paul's talking with grasp what he means. And when they do, they're shocked. Let's look at verse 32. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. The people suddenly understood what Paul was saying. He was saying something extraordinary something so extraordinary and different from what they thought gods were about that it demanded either sneering rejection or complete allegiance. Paul was saying that there is one God who's actually done something concrete and real in our world. God has collected the scrap material of a dead man's body and raised it to life forever, recycled it into life. And now, Paul says, God is working from these scraps the beginning of the judgment or the setting right of the whole world. Paul was a scrap collector, but God is the scrap collector. Humans, God's offspring, made in God's image, have turned his creation and turned themselves into a scrap heap or a sin heap, to use the biblical term. And perhaps we're seeing seeing that today in our era more than any other. We are leaving each other and we're leaving our world for scrap. But God has done something in response to this, this desecration of his creation. And what God did was extremely risky, God was loyal to it. He was loyal. God didn't abandon his creation to start over again. 
he was loyal to it and to us. God came into the scrap heap himself in a human being, Jesus, and started playing scrap heap challenge, picking up the scraps and recycling and repurposing them. Jesus took fishermen and recycled them into fishers of men. He took scraps of bread and fed thousands of people with them. He took dirty bath water and turned it into the most delicious wine. He took sparrows and lamps and old cloths and weeds and seeds and coins and sheep and goats, so many random scraps of life, and worked them into the most wonderful stories, parables about who God is. He took leprous skin, he took paralyzed limbs, withered hands, blind eyes, bleeding wounds, dead bodies, and repurposed them for life. And he took his own body to the hill of Golgotha, where criminals were scrapped on crosses. And he let himself be made scrap too. Then, three days after he died, people met him again. People met him, and they could see and touch the nail marks in his hands and his feet and the wound in his side. This was Jesus, not some brand new creation. God had taken the old scrap of Jesus' wounded body and revived it forever. And what has happened to Jesus' body will one day happen to the whole world and all who follow him. That's who Jesus is, the beginning of God's recycling and resurrection of the whole world. So strange as it may sound, Scrap Heap Challenge, I think, brushes very close to the heart of who God is and what God is like. You and me are scrap. We are damaged, we are broken, and we can't help ourselves. But God has shown his loyalty and his love for us in Jesus, who in his life and his death and resurrection recycles the scrap and makes new things from it. And I think today I simply want to conclude with a reminder that as a church, I think we can embrace that identity wholeheartedly. Church is a scrapyard, not a nice club where good people come to show each other how good they are. No, church is a scrapyard. Our church is a scrapyard full of bad people, broken people like me and you, people who God is recycling and making glorious and good things out of. We had our church prayer together meeting last Tuesday and at it we celebrated Ascension's 140th birthday and we sang happy birthday and we ate lasagna and we asked each other uh, what what we're grateful for about Ascension. What are we thankful to God for about Ascension? And it was wonderful hearing what everyone said but one thing that someone said particularly struck out to me, they said, Uh, in not these exact words, that they're thankful for Ascension because Ascension feels like a place full of people who are aware of how frail and broken and weak they are, but who nonetheless love each other, build each other up, and invite God to use us. In other words, Ascension is a scrapyard. And in Jesus, God has, as it were, got out the bolt cutters and broken the padlock off the gates of the scrapyard and is now freely trespassing amongst us in our scrapyard, making new things from our brokenness. So you are scrap, and so am I. But God still wants you and me. He has fashioned life out of death in the resurrection of Jesus. And in just the same way, he can make a new creation from the scrap material of our broken lives if we let him. 
In a moment, we're going to have a, a time of worshiping God and uh, receiving prayer, if that's something you'd like to do. And I'd like to invite the band to come up um, and pre- prepare to lead us in worship. Thank you. And today I want to invite all of us to take this time to be real with God about you. In particular, those bits of you that you know are, are messed up and perhaps that you've left for scrap, that perhaps you've abandoned as kind of too far gone, too hopelessly broken. And let's invite God's healing into those scrapped areas of our lives today. God's recycling, God's resurrecting power into this scrap heap today. Let's stand to worship.